So, Emily, thank you for uh, joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you as well. I'm happy to be here with you. Great. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm Emily Butler. I am the Director of Preservation here at the fantastic Taliesin West. Um, I'm a, a staff member of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, which um, is in charge of the care of not only Taliesin West here in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, but also Taliesin, which is in Spring Green, Wisconsin. So I'm here in Arizona right now. Great, it looks very sunny indeed. <laughs> very sunny and very hot, it's 105. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, so uh, we, we, we know that Taliesin has an interesting history and uh, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about, uh, about its history indeed. Absolutely, absolutely. So Taliesin West is such a unique site. So um, I was referencing Taliesin and Spring Green so that is um, a home um, of Wright's, his home and studio uh, that Wright built in the early 1900s. Um, so Wright gets a little bit of exposure to Arizona in the 1920s. He has a couple of commissions that bring him out here. Um, and then in the, 19, uh, in the early 1930s, um, Wright's Wright kind of suffers from a bout with pneumonia. Um, and his doctor says to him essentially that if you can escape the harsh Wisconsin winters, you can extend your life by about 20 years. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's precisely what happened, right? Um, remembered Arizona. He came out here. He purchased this um, piece of land in 1937. And um, he spends every winter here um, from 1937 to 1938 until he passes away in um, 1959. And what's so special about Taliesin West is he never even refers to it as his home. When they came to Arizona, they were camping. Uh, it was his camp. Um, it was this great experiment and laboratory in the desert. And that it really is evocative of those ideals um, and, and we can kind of maybe get into more of those details as well. But I think that's what makes Taliesin West so special is that it's really just this um, experimental ephemeral camp in the middle of the desert. Um, so that has um, kind of grown and expanded. And today um, we are still this little island of, of um, what it would have been like here in the 1930s and the 1950s. Obviously now Phoenix and Scottsdale, where we are, um, have really grown up. They've become really major metropolitan cities. Um, but that wasn't the case when Wright came here. So they really were um, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, out in the desert. But you also have a very exciting role uh, within the organization. W would you like to tell us what you actually do there? Absolutely. So um, as the Director of Pres Preservation for Taliesin West, I have the um, great honor and great challenge of um, trying to preserve this site for all future generations. Um, and, you know, I have a background in preservation and I have a background in um, preserving right sites. I used to work at a site called Kentuck Knob, uh, which is not far from Fallen Water in Pennsylvania. So I have a background in this, um, but coming to Taliesin West was so exciting for me because of this idea that Taliesin West is not this, um, it, it, it is a monument, but it's a, a true living monument. Um, we still have residents here that live here that actually worked with Wright, that, that were his apprentices. So it really is this living, breathing, place and that's how we um tackle preservation here um, we have a little bit of a different view on preservation than what might be the i guess um traditional view we respect um the the, the, the fundamental values of this place as um as an experiment every winter when wright would come back here he would change something the site would grow and evolve and he would be playing with materials and he would um, move walls to, 
to expand things and add structures as the fellowship grew and they wanted um, say a, a movie theater or or a dance pavilion or things so it was this constantly evolving living organism and, and you know and that didn't stop after Wright passed away um, Wright knew that even after he after he passed away in 1959, the site would continue to grow and evolve. And and his apprenticeship program, his fellowship, continued to live here and continued to use the site. Um, so my role now is to to continue that legacy, to promote the active use of the site. Um, you know, we want people to be able to come here and truly experience Wright's architecture. You can't really understand what Wright was trying to do until you enter into a room and you sit down. Because Wright reveals different things to us, whether we're standing or we're sitting. Um, he has this beautiful idea of the space within. As you enter into his space, only then do you truly understand what Wright was trying to get at. Yeah, it sounds an honor uh, and a big challenge indeed. And did you always want to be a preservationist? Um, no, my, I originally thought I was going to be an archaeologist. Um, and I do have a degree in archaeology, um, but I found myself in Philadelphia, which is just such a fantastic city full of history. And I um, got an internship doing uh, physical conservation work on the historic structures in Philadelphia, and I just really fell in love. Um, and I was fortunate enough after graduating to be able to um, kind of slide into that role um, in Pennsylvania, which is my home state. And uh, at a, again, at the site called Kensick Knob, I, I, that was one of my first preservation jobs and I really enjoyed that. And then later I went back for my master's degree in preservation from Tulane. So. You mentioned uh, indeed that many, uh, that was a fellowship, uh, Taliesi West, uh, so many architects worked and, and studied there. And if you think about uh, contemporary uh, architects, uh, what do you think they can still learn from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's legacy? That's a fantastic question. So, you know, there's so many, Wright never wanted his apprentices to mimic his architecture. What he wanted was them to take his ideas, his ideas about organic architecture, this idea of the integration of the whole, um, not only of, of the structure, but of the site, of the, uh, of the landscape, bringing all these things together and also bringing in um, ideas about how individuals live and interact with their buildings, with their homes, um, how we can live a more beautiful life through architecture. So these are the ideas that Wright was trying to pass on to his fellowship. And I think you really see that. I mean, um, take John Lautner, for example. You do see um, Wright's teachings, and he's not mimicking Wright's work. He's taking those principles and applying them to his work in the places that he is working. Um, so I think that's really what um, not only architects who directly worked with Wright, but architects who have been influenced by him. I think those are the ideas that people are, are taking away. Um, I mean, Kengo Kuma is a really great example. Um, fantastic architect. Uh, and you really see the em embodiments in this fantastic modern architecture that Wright was trying to get at, this integration of natural light, um, working with the site, making the building a part of the site, this integrated unit, this integrated whole. Yeah, what, what architecture would be without him, right? <laughs> and uh, as you as you mentioned, uh, nature played a crucial role uh, in Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, and he certainly was a pioneer in the organic architecture field. Mm -hmm. uh, you also said that. Uh, today, um, we are slowly uh, starting to realize how important the link uh, between nature and architecture actually is. Why do you think it's taking us so long? You know, I think that that Wright, in a lot of ways, was a little bit on the fringe of, of, of his ideas. Um, you know, when you when you take a little a look back, he was 
thinking about integrating architecture with nature at a time when, you know, people lived in cities and, and, and it made sense for people to live in cities. The, the industrial revolution, that's where jobs were. Um, and Wright sort of rejected this idea, um, which is kind of expressed through his grand plan for a city called Broadacre. Um, you know, he wanted people to be more individual. They, he wanted them to have their own little slice of land. Um, and this is, you know, really expressive of his ideas of democracy. And that, I think, at the time, was a little bit on the fringe. You know, that, that really never um, came about. This gap between when Wright stopped working and, and after, his, after he passed away, there was this sort of, um, I guess, lack of appreciation of nature, not only in architecture, but in all things. And I think only now are we coming to understand the importance of nature, not only um, for, you know, our, our sustenance, our way of life, um, but I think that people are only now kind of coming back to nature and understanding its importance. And I think that architecture has sort of followed that same path. Um, you would expect architecture kind of lead the way, right, for for humanity, for society, and it it very much uh, looks and feels like it's the opposite, that architecture architects followed developers and developers followed money and business, of course, right. Mm -hmm. So uh, cities are very dense; uh, they tend to be developed vertically and not horizontally because it's, it's it's cheaper of course you can fit more people but then you go back and then you see how the masters like Frank Lloyd Wright actually understood already everything and it's kind of sad uh, to, to think that then we live here and we live now and a century after is still uh, still struggling with realizing how important those values that he understood back then uh, actually are uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's a sad consideration. However, we are getting there. So slowly. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I really think there there is a, a huge change happening in 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 architecture and in, in the field, and and people are you know thinking more creatively about how we can integrate our lives with nature, even in dense cities. You know, thinking about the green movement green spaces, trying to think about how can we bring nature even into our cities. And architecture is, is hugely important in, in that, you know. Um, so I think there's definitely a shift happening and, and people are really focusing on that. We uh, recently interviewed the owners of the Epstein House, uh, which is one of the Frank Lloyd Wright Susanian homes. <laughs> and uh, they mentioned how they actually uh, feel custodians uh, of a treasure. Uh, mm -hmm. And they feel like, a bit like what you said, they feel like they have to preserve this home for future generations uh, more than leaving it. And uh, they don't actually live there. Uh, they, they rent it because they want to share it with as many people as possible. So they mm -hmm. went through an extensive renovation. They did an incredible work. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, couple, uh, I have to say. And I'm wondering, do you think, however, that this is the right uh, spirit uh, or should these homes, because they are homes, be lived and adapted to contemporary dwelling standards to keep Frinkley Bright Vision alive? I think what they're doing is fantastic. I think that, I mean, I, I feel the same way. We are simply custodians and temporary stewards of these amazing structures and we need to make sure that they are preserved into the future. <clears throat> However, I mean, I think that there are, while there are lots of um, commercial and um, quote unquote house museum, even though we don't consider ourselves a house museum, but we are publicly toured, there are lots of Frank Lloyd Wright sites that are that, and that is important. It is important for people to be able to come to these sites and immerse themselves in this architecture. But I also think that, you know, there are so many right homes uh, and there are actually so many that are on the market right now. And I think it is important that people live in these homes, um, that they are 
um, people's primary dwellings, that people do um, take care of them, but also make them their own. Because that was Wright's intention, right? He never thought that you know people would be, um, you know, a hundred thousand people would be going in and out of these sites each and every day. He wanted them to be a home. He he built them specifically for a family to live in. So I think it's hugely important that you know Wright's homes remain um, as as private dwellings. And also, the reality is, is that, um, you know, not every site can be publicly toured. That's not necessarily a sustainable model for preserving um, just the amount of homes that exist on the market. Not only right homes, but other um, famous architects. So I think it's important that, you know, people like you, um, who love architecture, who live and breathe architecture, decide, hey, I would love to live in a Franklin Wright home. What better experience, what better way to raise my family, to live each day in this beautiful piece of art? Yeah, that's true. Many of our readers uh, own mid-century homes, of course, and we hear from them all the time and the joys and the struggles, of course. It's a recurring question uh, for them, and there are indeed uh, challenges uh, to maintain these homes. And my point of view on the historic uh, difference between uh, historic and, and old, let's say, it's it's very simple. For me, whatever left a mark uh, in in our history, it's historic. That that's It doesn't matter how old it really is, because there are buildings that have been built maybe 10 years ago or five years ago or yesterday, and then you look at them and you're like, this is gonna be here forever because it's so mind blowing, so advanced, the technology, it's so advanced that of course it's gonna be an historical building at a certain point. So it's very, Absolutely. yeah, but, but many people think it, historical buildings as old, the Colosseum <laughs> is an historical yeah. building, right? <laughs> but we don't have to go that far <laughs> in time. Do you have a favorite Frank Lloyd Wright house, by the way? I really like the Darwin Martin house in Buffalo. That's definitely one of my favorites. Um, the Hauling Water is obviously a spectacular house. Um, I can't, it's really hard to pick a favorite. I really don't have, I mean, all this architecture is completely unique, um, which is what was so interesting about it. No, it's it's already a quite good list, I would say. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. But, but, but Frank Lloyd Wright, we know, uh, he did not design only homes. Uh, he was commissioned for office buildings, hotels, churches, and so forth. Um, what are the common elements uh, between all of these works? So, yeah, I, I think a lot of people forget that Wright designed um, so much more than just um, residential designs. So, and I think, you know, take um, the Johnson Wax building, for, for example. Uh, so this structure is so beautiful. It was so interesting. And not only did it use these fantastic, um, they called the lily pads, and if you can kind of picture it in your mind's eye. Yes, I do. I love um, the building. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very small base, and it kind of just, you know, the, these columns just sort of come up, and they balloon out and create these beautiful little lily pads where natural light is streaming down through. I mean, it's such a striking building. And I think what's important about that is, um, you know, again, part of this idea, part of Wright's values, in the back, structure was built at a time when office buildings were dark, they were dank, you probably didn't really want to be in them, you probably had very little natural light. Wright changes this idea by developing this open concept, streaming with natural light, gorgeous building for all the office workers. And he was thinking about their lives and how they would live um, each day for however long they were there, um, not only in their homes, but in their offices, bringing beautiful functional architecture to bring beauty to your life and advance the way you live. Um, and I think that each building, he, he, he does that with in different ways. Um, you know, his, um, 
right comes from a transcendentalist and Unitarian background. So um, the religious buildings that he designs, um, let's take Unity Temple for example. Unity Temple is such a stunning building, but the exterior is remarkably simple, isn't it? Um, it's it's simple and it's perfect in its simplicity. It's almost it's br brutalist a little bit. Kind of, absolutely. Yeah, it is a little bit brutalist, isn't it? Um, and when you look at Unity Temple and you look at probably every other church in that area, the, the difference is so striking. Um, so Wright wants to think, he, he just thinks about things differently. Yes, indeed. So it, they're not just, uh, how do you say, boxes and they don't just have a function, but they need to be experienced, right? Exactly. I think that's, that's what Wright really did for architecture, was he got rid of the box. Um, as early as you know the beginning of the 20th century, he breaks down this idea that you have to live in little boxes in a larger box, which is what which is what homes were at the time, which is what architecture was at the time, really. And he creates this horizontality, this beautiful open plan architecture, natural light streaming through, um, something that wasn't seen in the United States at that point in time. And now that's how we want to live our lives, right? Everyone loves to, to live in an open concept plan house. Going back to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, he was very popular already back at his time. Uh, he was quite famous. I mean, he had some personal situation that was all, <laughs> that were all over the, the press and, and he was also, he felt also lots of pressure from it, from what I at least I know. Do you think he enjoyed this side of his work? Absolutely, absolutely. So Wright, um, Wright really knew how to market himself, which was completely genius. Um, you know, when you kind of compare it to today and the people who are most popular, who are out there, who are really influential with their ideas, they're, they understand how to market themselves and how to get themselves out there and use all the tools at their disposal to do so. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, what have you. They're using these tools to promote their, their ideas. Wright did exactly the same thing. Um, Wright went on tours, he did speaking engagements, he wrote lots of books, he would go on television. Um, he was not afraid to promote himself. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of people think of Wright as sort of egotistical um, in that way. There's, there's lots of people who, who make that comment. And I think that Wright was just really good at promoting himself and promoting his work, um, which is, you know, Wright's work speaks for itself, uh, obviously, but it doesn't help. Or it, it certainly helps when you are out there um, kind of with your feet on the pavement, making other people see your architecture and see your ideas and um, kind of see your point of view. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think the right most fan of um, being a personality, I guess sort of this larger than life personality. Um, he was ahead of his time also about that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, to, uh, to wrap up a bit our conversation, I would like to uh, ask how it is going during this pandemic, because I'm, I know that as all cultural organizations, uh, probably also Taliesin is suffering in this moment. And I, I wonder first, how is it going with you and uh, how the public is helping or can help you in this difficult moment? Absolutely. Um, yeah, this has been, an extraordinarily difficult time. Um, we are closed to the public right now, um, and we have been um, for a couple months at this point, um, just because of public safety concerns. Uh, of course, we are, our first priority is the health and safety of our staff, um, our residents, and um, the public that comes to visit us. So it has been really difficult. Um, you know, we have a fantastic leadership team. We have a, a fantastic staff who's really kind of taking the opportunity to use this time and spin something positive out of it. So, um, 
yeah, I would definitely encourage everyone to visit our website. We're doing virtual tours. We're trying to continue to engage with the public. We don't want to just, um, you know, close off um, and not allow anyone to experience this site. We want to continue that. We are doing virtual tours. We have um, virtual summer camp going on right now. So we're really trying to do as much virtual as possible. Um, have a virtual palliative and talks where we kind of have different panel discussions with um, different professionals and different topics. Um, yeah, so we're really working towards that. And on the uh, facilities and preservation side, we are, you know, not sitting on our hands. We're taking this opportunity to get a lot of work done. Um, the spaces are empty, um, which is, you know, a negative, but also a positive because we can we can get in there and uh, really take take advantage of uh, taking care of some deferred maintenance, and making sure that when we do open, the site looks as fantastic as it possibly can. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll definitely say that um, you know. If anyone's interested in becoming a member, that is the, possibly the greatest way to support us right now. Um, and not only a member of the Friends of Life Foundation, but any local historic cultural institution, they really need your help right now. So becoming a member, um, doing what you can to help, uh, because when we do reopen, our membership gives you um, access to not only Taliesin and Taliesin West, but other sites as well. We have a reciprocal program, which is really fantastic. And you can learn about that on our website, which is franklinwright.org. A few days ago, uh, it was Franklin Wright's birthday. It was, June 8th, yep. Exactly. So as a last question, what would you uh, tell him on his birthday day if he was here? Oh, well, what a great question. Um, I would say thank you for inspiring me. I mean, I'm so inspired by Wright's work every day. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to come to a place every day that I am surrounded by beauty and I can make a difference and I can promote Wright's ideas and giving me a sense of fulfillment and purpose in my life. So I just want to thank you and um, happy birthday. Emily, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank you. I hope uh, I hope to see you and to talk to you again soon. You as well. Bye bye.